It's, it's inter- uh, most people when they think of FM synthesis, uh, the step down from MC32, they think of the ad lib and the sound blaster, which use an OPL3. Uh, no, sorry, an OPL chip uh, made by Yamaha, which is also in some synthesizer keyboards from the 80s that you can buy. So you can pick up a synthesizer keyboard that right. sounds like your old uh, ad lib sound blaster cards. Yeah, I just I just reread something. Um... On again in a Sierra group um, that I'd forgotten, or maybe maybe on a forum actually, um, which was one of the many confusing options in Sierra's install program <laughs> was the IBM Music Feature Card, um, which yeah, what actually the hell used was that? <laughs> it. It was the Yamaha FBO One, which was another option in in some Sierra games. I think Space Quest Three is one of them that has both, but it um, was basically the Yamaha FBO One. Um, on a card so they're the same thing um just one is a card and one is a, a synthesizer yeah similar to how sierra would release the mt32 on a sound card later on i had a roland sound canvas as a daughter board uh for for those of you who've never seen one of those it's like a parasite that leeches onto your uh, sound blaster <laughs> 16 and just sort of dry humps it while you put it into the uh, slot inside the I computer mean- and the even more fun fact about daughter boards is if you put a daughter board on um, something that can't handle the voltage for it, everything gets fried. <laughs> I'm so glad it's I put it on a real Sound Blaster 16 because I used to have well, like a knockoff. Well, there was, there was even some synthesizers that, um, that would take daughter boards. There's famously a Korg synth um, for game music, the NS5R, which will take daughter boards. Really? Um, and, and if you put the wrong one in it, <laughs> you know, mismatch and all sorts of fun happens. Well, I'm... Uh, yes, people have blown their synth um, by putting the wrong daughter board in. But I'm yeah, there lucky. was... Th- well, there was different daughter boards at that point in time. There was, um, there was an XG daughter board, which would let you have full Yamaha XG in your Korg general MIDI synth. And then Korg got smart, and instead of making people go down that insane path, um, <laughs> just included the daughter board sounds added as spec. So yeah, you no longer had to, to do was, the expensive and I was, I was, rare option. But yeah, the, the sound canvas daughter boards are so rare now. I have to as as much as we sit here and wax poetically about the MT32 and the SC55 being, you know, mwah, chef's kisses and all yeah. that, there is a certain charm to that OPL Yamaha chip, especially when you put in games like 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 the old Cocktail Vision games, like Inca and stuff. They did amazing oh, well, yeah. they were, things. They were originally composed for that too, which makes a difference. Um, oh yeah, and at Apogee, Epic Mega Games, you know, same thing. Those games are all composed for us and. and FM synthesis and sound amazing. I mean, mm. they still sound amazing. You boot up the original Duke Nukem, sorry, Duke Nukem 2, because Duke Nukem 1 had no music. Yeah, um, Duke Nukem 2 had you know, the, kick the, ass. the music's amazing. Um, any of the Apogee games from the early 90s with music are just 10 out of 10 or close to it. Mm. Uh, obviously, you could, you could do stuff with the MT32, like you said, the sound effects on Fleapart and stuff. You could do some really awesome stuff with that. The FM synthesizers were more versatile than we give them credit for sometimes, because you could do really abstract weird shit with those. <laughs> uh, I'll, I will agree with you, and I'll also say that the MT32 done at its best, probably even more so, because the thing... Um, about the MT32 was not only could it make instruments and sound effects both, but you could make custom instruments. So the yes. early Sierra games basically used the MT32 stock instruments and then did different things for sound effects. As a result, a lot of the games have quite dated sound in terms of the quality of the instruments. Because, um, mm-hmm. again, the tech is now almost 35 years old. Go figure. Um, but in the late 80s and especially the early 90s, before General MIDI um, and whilst the MT32 was still being used, and especially at Dynamics, um, the Sierra composers did all custom instruments. And the stuff that was able to be accomplished um, was pretty amazing. I mean, both in the sound effect world, they could do explosions, they could do... um, dog woofing they could do all, all kinds of crazy stuff um and they really aced it but the quality of the soundtrack uh 
the best example I can come up with is the, the soundtrack to the game Willy Beamish. You know, I I love that game and I'll defend it to the death, which is again <laughs> a story for another time. But the soundtrack is just a showstopper. Um, if you, much as I would say, Space Quest Three is the first soundtrack to check out with an MT32. If you want to hear audio design, you know, sound and music both mm. for sound. Uh, sorry, for music, you want to hear Willy Beamish. I mean, that will just make you think, wow. Mm. Um, to think that's coming out of a synthesizer and not a digital recording. I've never actually yeah. heard Willy Beamish. I should check that out. You, you'll you like it too, because most of the music is synth. You I know, do it's, like it's not my synths. It's, it's, not, it's not what you would expect for a kid's game, although really it's for adults playing through a kid's mindset but uh, one of the reasons i've never finished willy beamish is because it is fucking there's brutal a of, <laughs> there's there's a lot of issues um it's there's timer, timer bugs and now oh, yes. there's some game design issues that once you deal with timer bugs you still have to do it but that we'll, we'll we'll talk about that another time but yeah, as far sure. as the soundtrack goes it's mostly synth music mostly slight slight european flavor to it um and just just really well executed, yeah. Um, which a lot of the Sierra games, unlike Dynamics, you, you know, even Space Quest Four, for example, probably I would say the biggest failing on the the MT32 is using a lot of MT32 stock patches for orchestral instruments, which yeah. I don't really understand why that was was the case. So, you know, some lovely games of of, of that era that have uh, just general Roland support. Uh, and if you run, for instance, my favorite uh, non-Sierra game, Beneath the Steel Sky, with, mm. uh, with, with the Roland MT32 emulator Munt on the side, uh, you get some interesting results. There was a problem with, the, with a few game companies would list MT32 and, and General MIDI sort of side by side. And even Sierra on their boxes didn't do themselves any favors by listing... MT32 and General MIDI compatible with MT32 usually taking first billing. Mm. So, um, and especially given the MT32 is what people would have known probably at the time, because um, obviously it existed before General MIDI. And also so, Sierra Punk. So there's them. a large amount of, yeah. They really, they, exactly. they plucked the shit out of the MT32. I was actually, I've actually been working on doing Beneath the Steel Sky uh, reorchestration. Hopefully. Very cool to be able to put that out on vinyl. We'll see. I want to see what Revolution says about it first. You rip the uh, the MIDI audio from Beneath the Steel Sky, and there are some very nice jazzy tunes in there. And mm. what, what the guy who composed it just did was just throw it all, because it's all just one electric piano, so of course it all goes mm. into the same track. But if but it has like it has lead and it has bass and it has middle bits like chords and stuff and just separating all that out and you go is this note supposed to be in the chords or is it a bass or oh god it took forever one thing I'm, one thing I'm unbelievably thankful for is about about extracting um, from Sierra Games is tracks that are combined in game um, are separated in the extracted data so if you have that bass and, and other part thing and they are composed for two different channels in the game if you record it it all ends up in one channel but in the if you extract it it ends up coming to the same channel but separated out so you can assign it to a different channel this is where we get into some interesting technical stuff because this is something i learned back when i was in high school then forgot all about and then very very recently like a week ago uh, it all came rushing back like an avalanche um, because my my next project is doing the reorchestrations for Space Quests 1 and 2, the original AGI versions. But and This is probably your project that I'm most excited about, to be honest. <laughs> uh, what I'm doing is I, I wanted to get my hands on the Apple IIGS MIDI data because that is different from the IBM PC. It actually has multiple channel music in it and and a, a bunch of music stuff that's not in the IBM PC versions or any other versions. Does it still have the the same Space Quest theme? It does, but in a sort of uh, spruced up version. I mean, the best mm. you could do in the IBM PC version was the Tandy 3 voice, which is mm. good. It has the main theme and it has a bass and it has a little percussion thing going on. Uh, the, uh, the Apple II GS version has, I think, seven or eight channels of stuff going on wow uh, it's, it's, it's yeah I, ha 
I had a guy send me the Apple 2GS stuff for the King's Quest games, um, and it was quite amazing how... I mean, it was basically like what Sierra would do in the first few MT32 games. You know, yes. it was that sort of level. It was a machine that existed for a brief blip of a time that was way too expensive for people, but it had an actual, not just an FM synthesizer, but it had, it had a digital. Didn't it have an Ensonic? Yes, it did. It? Yes, it did. An Ensonic yeah. uh, thingamajig. Shout out to Kevin that taught me that. Uh, but for the longest time, all the tools uh, in the AGI community, which is vast and very un oh. underappreciated, by the way. Yeah, no, I, I will completely agree. I mean, hey, look at the Space Quest fan games that have been able to be made in AGI. It's amazing. Yeah. I, and this all happened when I was sort of on hiatus from the community, mm. like in the early 2000s. Some, just quietly, I was running it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is ancient history. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, there's this amazing community of like people like New Rising Sun uh, who go in and re, you know, reverse engineer Brian, all this stuff. We'll give a shout out to Brian Provinciano as well. He did some pioneering work in that area. I mean, it is. The guy that made AGI, he made AGI and SCI Studio both. Oh, yeah. And uh, Peter Kelly, who did the first uh, yeah, AGI Peter Studio. Kelly. Uh, Big shout out to him. I oh. haven't talked to him in a very long time, but another great Australian. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Peter and, and Andrew Branscombe, who's still around, the collector who also uh, runs SierraHelp.com. All these people made a million different mm. utilities and extraction tools yeah, and yeah. stuff Absolutely. you can do to code your own st stuff in AGI, but it's all based on the IBM PC specs. Because that's what everyone had. Uh, no one had an Apple II GS. So what happened was, yeah. they they can they can sort of read the Apple II GS versions because it is sharing some code base with the IBM mm. PC version, but the MIDI data that comes out of it is all garbage because it's a different mm. spec or something. So what I ended up doing was, uh, at, at at Andrew Branscombe's suggestion, I contacted the guy who does uh, Win AGI. Uh, sort of mm. the spiritual successor to AGI Studio, and is done by a dude named Andrew Corson, who I sort of sent a message, hopefully uh, hoping that he could somehow extract MIDI data from mm. the AGI versions of you know SQ1 and SQ2 uh, 2GS versions. And he went, I don't know shit about <laughs> MIDI data, right. but I'll take a look over the weekend. And then he comes back a weekend later and says, turns out it was actually quite easy. Win AGI can now read Apple 2GS MIDI data and export it as MIDI data. And what I That's got out awesome. of it, it is. And it was like, oh man, I've, already I've, been, makes me happy. I've been beating my head against this wall for close mm. to a year now. Uh, but somehow now, now I can actually get MIDI data out. But what happened was the MIDI data that came out of it was all in one track, but different channels. And... That's when, uh, that's when okay. this thing came rushing back from the past was, there's a difference <laughs> between type 0 and type 1 MIDI. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't uh, know if you want to take this one because I still don't quite understand it, but uh, I no, ended up finding a converter. I don't really understand it either, to be, to be honest. Channels um, and tracks in MIDI mean something entirely different than what you think it does. Basically, type 0 and type 1 MIDI data are old and new type. And there's even, there's even a type after type 1 called possibly type 2 or possibly something else. <laughs> Um, but basically, type one is the MIDI data that anyone familiar with MIDI data is familiar with. It's normal. Um, oh yeah, I guess type two was could could have certain things combined with it, like karaoke data and something. It's something again that doesn't apply to. Oh, you could sync up digital sounds or something like that. Possibly, yeah. yeah there's a few yeah. weird weird things. Um, and of course, there's variants on MIDI format that each company that had a MIDI program um, had where you could save the, that particular program's data plus the MIDI data. Mm. All Sierra, um, just, here's a fun fact for you. So as well as being SND, um, Sierra's master format was, <laughs> was not always MIDI. It was sometimes other formats. For example, the Hollywood composer Craig Safan that did Larry Five um, mm. composed in Voyetra software. Um, and so the master format for the game is um, SNG, um, which is Voyager's, one of Voyager's internal formats. So Space Quest IV, um, some of the original comp compositions are the same. So uh, briefly, what happens when you import a MIDI Type 0 
old format thing into a modern digital audio workstation <laughs> is that you get a single track with all the MIDI data in the song all squished into one track. Yeah, it's, it's what we call a logistical nightmare. Yes, luckily there is an, uh, an on, uh, there's a MIDI converter, uh, a bunch of them actually, a bunch of converters. I'm leaning oh. over here. I'm just, I'm, I'm just opening some Apple II data in the background that I got from this guy. A MIDI apparently has, can have different tracks and have different channels within tracks. So one track can play different instruments. You can just sort of swap between them. And the difference yeah, well, between MIDI they... zero and one is MIDI zero cannot have multiple tracks. It can only have multiple channels. Whereas MIDI one can have multiple tracks and multiple channels for reasons no one knows. All I can say is the King's Quest one AGI track I just opened was different tracks and different channels and was MIDI one data. Oh, okay. Well, that's no, uh, that's that's probably not. That's a conversion. I have I have no idea um, what it looked like originally, but that's the format I have it in at the moment. I think I should backpedal here for a second and just quietly wonder if you have perhaps been sitting on MIDI data for Space Quests one and two all this time. And no, I don't. I, <laughs> okay, I, I, I am just checking. I am. I I don't. I don't have. Um, anything for any AGI games other than King's Quest 1 through 4, which I only obtained recently. Um, but I should be able to get it for other games, and I will, we will touch base about this soon. Um, but I do have master soundtracks for... Uh, in the Space Quest world, I guess I only have Space Quest 6. Um, and I have some Space Quest 4 master tracks, and I have, for some reason, the master sound effects from Space Quest 1 VGA. <laughs> I have no idea why Mark Siebert was sitting on those. Maybe he made them, but yeah, I have the original. That was one of the first games to have digitized sound effects, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Space Quest 1 VGA and Space Quest 4. So, so that might be the reason he had that, because it was a piece of history, because I have them in their native format, which mm. is a format that ends in .smp. Oh, Sam, that's, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's I think Creative right. Labs. Is, Creative yeah, Labs' yeah, that's, uh, proprietary format. Because right. uh, they open, I, I can open them in a DAW if I tell them the right um, specs. Yes, and Audacity should be able to open them as well. If you tell them the right specs, you import them as raw PCM audio and say, so yeah. many kilohertz, so many. Oh, God. Have you ever tried up just on a tangent? Uh, as, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know exactly what you're going to say. Right? <laughs> as you may you have did, noticed. You uh, need to explain it. Right. I just, uh, well, the Space Quest 4 resource audio file is uncompressed PCM audio. They would, Sierra would later <laughs> compress them. Have you ever tried opening that thing and telling, giving it the wrong specs? The best, the best one Nightmare. I can tell you is King's Quest V because King's Quest V um, has a bunch of different versions. So you've got the PC CD version. There's it's an FM Towns version. There's um, uh, there's there's other versions on top of that. Oh, there's a lot um, of different versions of five. Yes. Yeah, uh, and just for uh, the IBM and, PC too. And all of them, I I think some of them have different uh, specs as well for what the how the audio data is compressed. The bottom line is, as Trolls is hinting, if you select the wrong um, kilohertz and, and compression level and all the rest of it, your DAW will spit out noise. Just and not just you. noise, noise at max volume. So mm -hmm. if you are unfortunately wearing headphones, which I have done this many times, yes. um, you will get ear-splitting noise in your headphones. And really loud. Much like... like What's the Space Quest game where someone's wearing a headset and they it's it's um it's Sinjin at the hideout, right? Oh yeah. Well, well, you just not, yeah. You zap his head. It, it, that's that's pretty much how it feels. Yes. Um, right right there. It, it is not a good feeling and it is. I have done it oh. one time. I think I did it two or three times almost in a row. Um oh. so <laughs> that doesn't exactly uh, speak well for my penchant for, for learning. It's probably <laughs> oh, probably still. makes a good comparison to Roger Wilco, actually. But um, <laughs> oh, it is it is ear splitting. And the thing about just briefly, uh, space. Uh, no, sorry, King's Quest Five. There's actually a person on my SQH Discord who was trying. This is 
way off topic. I'm sorry, but uh-huh. it, but it, but you're absolutely right. There are so many weird versions of that game, and he was trying to There's replicate a Japanese audio version too. There's that as well. But he, he was trying to replicate that famous YouTube clip of someone playing King's Quest V with with all the digital samples swapped. Uh, like for instance, if you try, if you fall off a cliff, uh, Cedric suddenly says a line from the gypsy who goes, uh, no more for today, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and, and people have been trying to figure out why, how that audio swap actually, actually Andrew Branscombe wrote a utility that will randomize all the well, wave like files that. in that. But we, uh, a, a fellow on my SQH discord, uh, you may know him, Samuel Lawson, uh-huh. um, <laughs> my favorite, uh, my favorite little waffle. Uh, yes, uh, tried to, tried to f- replicate this for real, and what he found out was that a re-release, a budget re-release, not the KIXX, uh, but a uh, a Sierra Originals, Sierra Originals, yeah, okay. release of King's Quest V has the voice files in a much higher fidelity i think 16 bit or something and they're in a completely different order than the than oh, every other order. version of king's quest 5. i knew that i knew that there was a king's quest 5 version with with higher fidelity because someone found it out found it out on the quest studios forums aeons ago because there's a defect in in one or two of the files not just the low bit rate that the original version is in but there's some sort of audible um, you know, artifact that you can hear in one or two of the lines um, that play through in a normal playthrough of the game. Yeah. Um, that weren't present in a different version, and and uh, yeah, that that was how that was found out. But and I found it in I don't even remember which version now because there's so many darn versions of that game. Um, it is so bizarre. I think I think there might be two versions: that version you mentioned and a non-PC version. Um, and then the non-English language versions have higher fidelity too, but of course, that doesn't help us. Well, that is a whole lot. so bizarre. Uh, so it's, um, so that's that's why that's how you replicate the audio glitchy thing. And uh, oh yeah, and fun. <laughs> just on a back to a Space Quest tangent. Um, of, if you want to play a regular game that has audio files switched around, just play Space Quest Six. Oh, and it does it normally, both in an audio and music way. <laughs> what what happens if you uh, different versions of Space Quest Six have audio swaps? No, the regular version of Space Quest Six has both audio lines present and missing, going to incorrect places, and has music, which you're probably aware of, not set up to play in the correct rooms. So well, how do you trigger some this? music? Well, um, audio. Uh, another Sierra community person, a Krill, figured it out because there is a whole bunch of audio in the resource.org file that is never in the game. I know and that. Yet I've seen has her... clear has clear obvious places where it should belong. Yes. And then the, conversely, there's a couple of times where something doesn't fit the the place you click on. Um, also, it's just it's just the regular version that has. Oh, yeah, I, I always thought those were programmer oversight. Oh, I, I thought you meant like there's. Well, yeah, they are there's a different version. <laughs> no, no, no. There's no special. Space Quest Six is actually the only special versions of Space Quest Six are the is the trailer version, um, which I don't know if I told you about, but I found it recently, only in the last twelve or so months, um, and has the non-final voice actors voicing the introduction amongst other things it's um, not the rolling demo that's been on youtube for a, a while is it you mean the, all the, the no you yeah it, it could be there's two there's actually what i found out this is where it gets weird there are multiple pre-demo versions so there's there's a couple of different ones one is a trailer version and one is just like a rolling uh, they're both rolling demos, but one is they're they're different, and there are also variants on the the playable demo too. Oh no no no! This I have to pick your brain on because I was under the impression that there was the rolling trailer demo, the one that came on a CD-ROM and has sort of like a slideshow and then a enthusiastic voiceover that just talks over it. That's that's been on YouTube for quite a while, and then there was the uh, talky demo that uh, that I played on my channel. I did not know. And this is the first I've heard of this, that there are several versions of that demo. I found this out very late because 
uh, I was working with the original composer, Neil Grandstaff, to find all the different audio versions. And when Neil sent the Space Coast 6 audio over, the first reaction, um, and you would have the same reaction, was what the heck are half of these tracks? Because they don't play in the game. Um, and only some of them are in the resources. Um, because Space Quest 6 has a ton of audio in the resources that never plays in the game. It does. Both, both audio and music. Um, and programmer oversight, both deliberate and accidental, is, is part of the reason. But some of them, re- we f- what we found out from these um, ancient trailers that have never been shown in the community or, or perhaps recently in the interim, um, is that they play only in this trailer. Um, yet they still are in the final game resources and in the same resource number that they were in the um, trailer. And finally, getting the full backstory, talking to Neil, he's like, oh, yeah, that's the trailer music. <laughs> you know, like, it's no big thing all along. And I'm like, okay, well, that would explain, <laughs> that would have helped me through a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out where the heck <laughs> this music Roger Wilco, please step forward. It is the opinion of this tribunal that as punishment for your crimes against the Federation, you are to be decommissioned. You are hereby stripped of the rank of captain. Gentlemen, so long as his body is intact. Do you understand? Yes, we got it. Yes, right, 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 we got it. Yes, yes, right. Good. Now, I believe you'll find him here on Polysorbate 60 on shore leave. I'm ready. Energize. So the very, the very short, the very short explanation is that Space Quest Six has two soundtracks. One what is in the final game in the order that is in the game and two what neil grandstaff actually intended right so that that that's and they, they overlap so it's it's quite complicated